Welcome everyone. My name is Brianna Rodriguez. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the public affairs representative at the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health. For those who are calling in, I'll give a brief visual description. I am a Latina in my mid twenties. I have long dark hair and a blue shirt on, and I have a virtual background up of the University of Texas at Austin campus. I am very pleased to be your host for this webinar titled Decolonizing Self-Care Practices for the Hispanic Latinx Community. Thank you all for joining us. We truly hope that you find today's presentation engaging and helpful in your work. This webinar is brought to you by the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, an initiative funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to provide free training and ongoing consultation to all professionals that serve individuals with mental health challenges. Our region is Region 6, covering the states of Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arkansas, Louisiana, and our tribal communities. The South Southwest MHTTC is a project of the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health, which is housed at the Stevie Hicks School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin. This presentation was prepared for the MHTTC, MHTTC network under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. The opinions expressed in the presentation are the views of our speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. Okay, now that all the uh, official stuff is out of the way, I'm so excited to tell you about our amazing presenter today. We have Ari Acosta. Ari is a mental health, gender and equity specialist. Her current work involves providing technical assistance and trainings around cultural humility and mental health application of the class standards and diversity, equity, and inclusion to behavioral health agencies in Texas. She has two masters, one in sexuality counseling and another one in women and gender studies, plus eight years of experience as an assistant professor, clinical psychologist, and human rights special specialist in Venezuela, where she's originally from. Ari reached her 10 years of experience in the mental health field, adding intersectional lenses to her work while bringing her lived experience as an immigrant cisgender Latina woman in the United States. Thank you so much, Ari, for being with us here today. I will pass the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Bree, and good morning, everyone. Let's see, there we go. I'm so excited about uh, sharing my morning with you all and um, to be able to have the opportunity to talk about this uh, topic that I very much enjoy and I'm passionate about. Um, we're going to talk about decolonizing self-care practices for the Hispanic Latinx community. Um, before we start, I always like to do a uh, land acknowledgement, even though I know we're in the online world, and I know there are several people connecting from different places. Um, I am in what it's called Austin, Texas, um, so I'll do it from here. I am standing in the traditional land of the tribes Alabama Cushara, Cado, Carrizo, Comecrudo, Coahuitecan, Comanche, Kikapu, Lipanapache, Toncagua, and Isleta del Sur Pueblo, and all the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been and have become a part of these lands and territories in Texas. <clears throat> we acknowledge the painful history that has brought us to reside on this land, and we seek to evaluate the effects on settling colonialism and our participation in that process, searching ways for the healing of intergenerational trauma. We honor the indigenous caretakers of these lands and waters before us, the indigenous peoples today and the generations to come. All right, um, so thank you so much, Brie, for the uh, professional introduction. Um, I feel like sometimes um, in events like this or when we talk about topics related to um, self-care or um, decolonization or any topic related to social work and uh, humanity itself, part of the what, what brings us here to share uh, and to connect um, to share resources and information is, um, and to listen to each other is to know who we are, right? And where we come from. Um, so what you see here right now is a picture of my hometown. 
um, in Venezuela. It's called Barquisimeto, the state of Lara. It's a very small town with perfect weather all year long. Um, and I wanted to share it with you because this is where I grew up. Uh, for those uh, calling in, I will do a visual description. And I am a fair skin Latina. I have long brown hair. I am wearing glasses and a purple long sleeve sh uh, shirt. Uh, but for that personal introduction, I always want to uh, share a little bit more about myself. Uh, so as Bruce said, I'm cisgender, I'm an immigrant. I come from Venezuela. I've been in the US for the last uh, three years. Uh, my first language is um, Spanish. You probably will see it if you don't hear my accent already. You'll probably see a few words coming up um, during the presentation. Um, I identify as Venezuelan. Uh, of course, I have ancestors um, around uh, my tribal communities back home, especially from the uh, YU tribe. And of course, um, from the colonizers from uh, Spain. Um, but I started identifying as Latina when I moved to the US because, well, of course, um, I wasn't an outsider until I moved in, right? So um, I still identify as Venezuelan. Uh, but one thing that I really wanted to do on this piece is that um, what are the expectations from this presentation? Uh, I'm not sure how much of how many people are familiarized with the idea of decolonizing mental health, decolonizing practices and self-care, um, which is a beautiful and very broad topic. And we have an hour to discuss this. And um, I want us to have the expectations for it. Um, so this will be a brief overview of decolonizing self-care practices, uh, but foremost, an invitation to rethink ourselves and our history and reconnect with our culture, our practices, and honor our journey of wellness. So I hope you sit, relax, and, and join me with, on the chat box. If you wanna share your comments, I'll try to um, look at them and talk to you all. Thank you, everyone who's putting your names and where you are. Thank you so, so much for that. Okay, so to start, um, I would like to ask you a question if you can use the chat box to share your answers. Um, I love to ask this question personally, like we were in a group setting when everybody's sitting together, um, but can you share with me what practices do you use to heal a common cold? What are the things that you usually do that are not necessarily related to medicine, any type of medicine, um, but are more re related to cultural practices or things that your uh, parents, your caretakers, your um, family or yourself do while you have a common cold, you're feeling under the weather. Okay, I'll give it a minute to see the answers on the chat. We see, okay, sun, water, tea and rest. That's what I'm having right now, Juan, thank you. Uh, go outside, okay, to rest. Cinnamon tea with honey. Yerba buena, oh, that's awesome. Hydration, rest and sleep. Moms and grandmothers, herbal medicines. Oh, vapor room, see, that's, that's we're gonna talk about that. Okay, covering up. Oh, pozole, it's great, brie, chicken, noodle soup. This is great. Hot beverages, chamomile tea, exercise, hug my pillow. Victoria, I think we're on the same thing. Collar de ambar, muy bien. Caldito de pollo from mama. A shot of mama Juana. Okay, that is awesome. So you can continue to put your comments on the chat box for everybody to see. Um, so I love to start with a question like this because usually, so a common cold, what you need is rest and liquids and fluids, right? It's a, it's, since it's viral, what you need to do is kind of rest and let your body uh, fight, fight it. Um, but we have so many other things that we do to heal, to make the process more like easier, to make us more comfortable what we're, um, what we're dealing with this, right? So there's awesome to be, 
it's awesome always to hear new practices and, and ways of how people um, show their cultural values and their connections with others and how they deal with a moment that it's a vulnerable moment when you're feeling sick. If it's a group that has different cultures and, and, and are from different countries and different experience, you can see the most wonderful practices. I've heard things like putting onions under the bed, uh, rubbing your feet with all different balms, um, doing uh, practices with people that involves other people, like um, uh, putting blankets where you need to have people surround you the entire time. Um, there's many, many uh, wonderful practices. And for the Hispanic and Latino community, uh, which I'm of course part of, uh, why we notice that we have kind of like the same things, right? The, um, there's practices around, of course, even like songs and things to say as, a, as, a, as an affirmation of like, you're gonna get better. And sana sana colita de rana, of course, is part of what, one of the things that we say. And it's, um, um, I would love to know more about the history of where it comes from. It be has become, uh, a wonderful tradition to say it. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're going through, if it's physical or sometimes even emotional, this is a, a wonderful spell for us to, to say every time I say it or somebody, especially if it's an older woman from my family who says that to me, well, cuddling me, I immediately feel better. Um, yeah, so we have different practices, right? And of course, this big pepper is there because it's a wonderful balm for all the the aches. <laughs> um, and um, I do a lot of uh, consultations regarding culture. Uh, how, however, I, uh, I can um, have a lot of li limitations, uh, especially in the US. Uh, but I do a lot of cons uh, consulting with um, mental health psychology practices and um, um, regarding to culture. And I get a question a lot, and which I very much appreciate because it's people telling me they're um, providers or psychologists or um, any professional who is working with different cultures, if there's there's always like a interest on on knowing, Ari, but do these practices actually work? Like, is there something that I'm not seeing uh, from my culture? It's something it's something from a new culture that they know. It's just like this ancestral. Uh, knowledge that they have and and I'm not I don't have access to or that I don't understand um, is this some like magical feature that they have that I'm not aware of um, and I appreciate the question um, because it comes from a curiosity background um, but sometimes sometimes my answer which is not perfect but sometimes my answer doesn't fulfill uh, the needs just because um, if you want uh, if you're looking for a specific scientific reasons, like a, the, the cure, like the medicine cure of something. It's more complicated than that, but it's also more beautiful than that. Um, so this practices work, they do work. And if you wanna put it in a way for like scientific approach, more like the head explanation instead of a heart connect, connectivity explanation, um, it browse around uh, placebo effects and why, um, why things like that um, creates an effect on your body and makes you feel better and, and actually changes some chemical components even in, in, in your body. Um, in the case of healing practices or practices like this, of having people next to you, of doing these rituals and even having songs that will make you feel better, um, the practices do work because um, they're all passing knowledge. They're all passing care. It's about family support and compassion towards vulnerability. They share a sense of belonging and traditions. Um, I don't, I'm sure, and I would love to hear from you on the chat as well, if, if there's nothing more rewarding, I guess, when you're feeling super sick. And uh, I've heard it from my family and friends is that there's, <sighs> There's a feeling of that you, the people care about you when you feel sick and you look terrible, it's, even if you have like the common cold, something that you probably want to be left alone, I've heard here in the US. But from where I come from, usually people um, from your families, people who are really close to you are the ones who take care of you. Um, so when I moved here and I was by myself, I there was a lot, a lot of sadness regarding just having gripe or having cold. 
because you have to take care of yourself, um, which means in this particular situation, because of the traditions that are around it, it's just, well, I don't have anybody that cares about me. <laughs> that is not true anymore, of course not, but um, I have friends who told me, yeah, yeah, I feel the worst when I'm alone and I'm sick. Um, so this practice is by itself, like the idea of rubbing big uh, vaporub on your chest, uh, somebody's rubbing it onto you, somebody's is putting blankets around you, somebody's making you the tea or making you the soup. It's not necessarily only the soup or the balm or, or the practice itself, it's what it means, it's what it's sharing, it's what it's showing to you. And if you're part of that culture, if you're part of the generations and generations of that passing knowledge, it has more meaning of what it represents. Um, so of course they work. Uh, healing, of course, has a, a social, historical, and cultural component to it. It's not just um, a cause and effect medicine that is gonna, you know, change some chemicals, uh, molecules in your body, and it's gonna um, make an effect like that. It has more. It's more complex. It's more. Uh, intricated and it's more beautiful in the same way, right? So it has different components to the to what we know around healing. And for our community, Hispanic, Latinx, um, Chicanx, uh, word that you want to use to englobe a huge, huge amount of people, um, there's of course this components around it. Um, I'm going to try to go um, and talk a little bit about each component and how we look at them. Um, around healing. So when we talk about social, the social component of healing, um, especially for our community, it's um, identifying all the ways that in, in society, ourself, our identity uh, is based out of. So it's, it could be uh, when we talk about like demographic information, it can be about something that links different groups of people. Um, knowing the differences between, in between or within the diversity, right? So when we talk about Hispanic, Latinx, um, we have um, 19 countries in Latin America, right? So it's, of course, this is a, and this is why it's important for me to do the authentic personal introduction. So you can see that from my point of view, I identify as Latina, but I'm an immigrant as well. So it's, it's a huge part of people who, um, identify themselves like that, but are outside of the US. It's like, even if there's outside of the US, there's 19 countries in Latin America. So it's with each one different sociopolitical stories, um, history, different cultures and values, different languages besides not only Spanish, but Portuguese and of course, indigenous languages. Um, there's different social class distribution. One of the things that I got very impressed maybe impressed is not the word, but one of the things that, that impact, impacted me the most when I moved in, um, it was that a lot of demographic information in the US doesn't uh, focus on social class distribution, which in my country it does. Um, and here it doesn't. Um, anyways, it, and in the US, of course, there's different generations um, of uh, Hispanic and Latinx communities and uh, different US locations, which um, I always wonder how it felt and how the communities are for being La Latino, Latina in Texas uh, or being in Iowa, for example. And how does that, how does that uh, social uh, socialization um, happens in different, even states within the same, um, the same country? Uh, levels of acculturation, different terminology, different ways of calling each other, different ways of identifying each other, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, we have the historical component of our community, which of course involves uh, colonialism itself, uh, intergenerational trauma, uh, migration, immigration, um, all the different uh, traumas and all the different challenges and, and barriers that are part of our history of uh, mobilization. There's a lot of history regarding uh, the economical and political aspects of each country of people who migrated to other ones um, and what happens of like all the background related to legal health and social protections, um, which is very particular of, of um, um, communities of color and in this case, Hispanic Latinx communities. And also has a cultural component. Uh, 
I want to remember that we're talking still about healing, right? So by lighting or putting light into this particular set, it will make us understand how healing could look like, right? Um, by knowing all this background. So we talk about like social and social determinants and, and social identities and what that means. We talk about like the history, all the things that we've been going through generationally and from different parts of the world and how it is today and where we are and a cultural component, right? Uh, which if there's beautiful information research about uh, what are the values that the Hispanic and Latinx uh, community has around uh, healing, but um, what are the things that kind of connect us? And we're all so many, so much different. We all come from all different places, but there's always like a thread or a line um, that unite us in, in some sort of way. Um, in this case, if we focus that line in cultural components, in this case, it's uh, the values of family and community. Uh, we, and I want to say this particular piece of being Venezuelan is that we treat a lot of things with laughter. Uh, sometimes we laugh because we cannot cry. It's a reyes para no llorar is a, is a saying that it's very, very in our core identity and the way that we do things. Um, uh, it's part of a cultural healing process. It's just being together and, and laughing about all the horrible things that are happening to us as a group and a community. It's, it's, a, it's a healing process. It's, it's part of who we are as a social, um, as a cultural value. The respect and importance of elders and their wisdom, of course, there's a huge, huge uh, thing about uh, their opinion and their their um, advice and it's very well respected, sometimes even feared uh, on certain um, Latin American communities, uh, which is part of who we are. Uh, personalismo, of course, and connection with others. And of course, collectivism, it's part of a value that I very much appreciate. And I've, I could see it more, especially moving into a new country and seeing how it's differently in here. Um, um, and this will bring us a lot of value and, 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 and a lot of self, um, protective factors around healing. So when we talk about colonization of self-care, um, what, what do we mean about that? Um, so we know what colonization means in terms of um, a particular movement or a society imposing and, and, and uh, their, you know, traditions, values, and erasing um, uh, civilization. In, in the terms of wellness and mental health, what it means is that the use of one and only approach that invisibilizes other perspectives. Um, it is a systematic negation of identities and practices that are linked to historically marginalized pueblos and communities. The idea of colonization in any I will think in any field, it will, it will mean the idea of erasing all the other perspectives and just imposing one model, right? Uh, a model that usually will has a certain, you know, it has a, a carry of power, it has a, a an institutionalized uh, imposition towards the rest, uh, and of course, invisibilizing the other ones. Uh, so when we talk about self care and wellness. Um, this idea is what. Uh, we want to challenge and the idea that we want to widen the perspective and include other ones that it, are been there for, you know, throughout history. It's just, um, um, it's a practice of like reclaiming them. Um, so th th this is another question and I would like uh, you all to help me on the chat is to share um, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about self-care? The first thing could be a first image, close your eyes and you think about self-care, how does it look like? That's perfect. Thank you for the comments. I'm, I'm reading the comments right now, it's great. Um, okay, so self-care, what it looks like, time off work, rest, slowing down, creating boundaries, create boundaries, peace, relaxing, loved ones, sanad. All right, I see other ones. 
my mom's cooking, seeking support, naps, there's perfect. Connecting with my higher power, it's wonderful. Decompressing, all right. Keep sharing on the chat. That will be, I would love to see all the, all the comments after the webinar ends and you all can see each other comments and maybe you know comment on each other's uh, self-care. Um, so when we talk about decolonizing self-care, it's because if you look, you can do any, you can Google it, you can use any engine, search engine um, to look and just browse self-care. How does that look like? And this, is what shows up in my search. Um, this is a, a screenshot. Um, I didn't cut and paste these images and, and put it all together. This is just you know scrolling down, and this is what it looks like. What we can see is um, very individual, uh, which is not bad, of course not. It's just like a one approach of doing self care, right? It kind of all links together. It's an individual. It's based on the body. It has, um, it has food involved, balms, a lot of like solitude, meditations, connection to plants and the nature. Um, it's very calm. Um, it, it looks soothing. If you keep scrolling down, it will be more, there's like there's yoga, there's other things underneath um, that are related to that. So um, for, for the idea of self-care and what we want to, make an invitation for if that if this is what you keep seeing if this is what shows up if this is what people think when we're going through something uh a lot of people are talking about self-care what, what what is that about it's, it's exactly and this is what it shows up this is what people are talking about um then it would probably make not very good a self-care practice if it's not resonating with you Right, um, and this is what basically this invitation is about. So it's um, when we talk about this, um, it's the idea of decolonizing the only one set of self care. I have a lot of um, friends in the U.S. who I met here, which and with this whole pandemic that we're still in, we're still struggling with. Um, it was. I'm sure you've heard a lot about self-care and we need to take care of each other. Everybody's going through a, a terrible time, one's more than others. Uh, if you can, and if you have the time and have the resources, please practice some self-care. And then a lot of people were trying to look for what does that look like? How does that, okay, well, I think I have time. I, I'm one of the privileged uh, person that had a, a place to live. I was by myself, I was safe. Um, I had time to do it, I had no, no idea of what to do. And if you browse, if that's the only thing that I could see, well, I'm terrible at doing yoga. I can't sleep my mind. Um, being alone, it was not a thing that for me was necessarily self-care. It felt, it felt devastating. It's not because of the concept of, oh, I can't be alone by myself. Of course I can and enjoy my company. But in times of need, in times of, of what I want to recharge, I recharge around people. And it was so hard to find, uh, especially as an immigrant, especially in a new country with, you know, even talking in English feels super foreign. Um, connecting and, and recharging in that way that will make me feel back to a state of wellness, it was super hard to find. Um, so what, what we mean with decolonizing self-care practices or uh, decolonizing wellness, especially for our community, uh, which have all these wonderful values and all this history and, 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 and ways that we treat uh, wellness and healing is um, an invitation of recognizing the social, historic, and cultural components of healing. It's not just um, a healing of the body as um, a vehicle, right? It's, it's, it's a healing in all those ways. And it can be not only mind and body, but um, including those components, the social, historical, and cultural components in our community, is expanding our view of who we are and where we come from, is reconnecting and rerouting ourselves in a racial and ethnic identity, and what does that mean? Um, it's about exploring, honoring, and fostering practices that are, of course, culturally ours. Um, usually at this point, people ask me, well, all right, but what does that mean? It means that I can't do 
the self care uh, the, that you just showed there is mainly so I can't do yoga because I'm Latina. Of course not. Oh, please, please don't. don't. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Um, those things are wonderful. And I know so many people that are discovering these practices and they feel so much better. It connects with them in a way that probably other practices don't. The, the invitation, because it's an invitation um, and, and sometimes could be a need is to widen our perspective of this, especially with communities that have different values. Um, things that I've learned of course, is my own personal lived experience, but things that I learned living in in the United States and specifically in Texas, because I haven't been in a lot of other places, um, spend little time. Um, it's a lot of, uh, there's a wonderful thing about uh, being independent and being by yourself and the way that you can take care of yourself and your, you know, it, it has a lot of things of like dealing with your things, uh, your emotional, uh, regulating yourself emotionally, being, being aware of your limits and putting limits to others, that it's wonderful, that it's very wonderful. And that's the thing that I've learned and, 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 and appreciate about this culture too. But I also need to recognize the values of mine and, and the things that identify myself, uh, which is very uh, connected with other people. And, 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 and that's how we, we connect. And that's how I view uh, self-care. I can't do self-care by myself. That doesn't mean that it's a bad thing either. So it's more about figuring out what are the um, practices that are related to healing that are of course culturally connected, that are of course historically con connected and social connected to our of all identity. So uh, why is it important to widen this view? So, it, this is just general, of course, just to keep in mind, well, many of us are experiencing poverty, working multiple jobs, or don't have the resources, time to participate in self-care rituals, especially if those are the rituals that we think they are. Oh, I'm going to do my nails. I'm going to go to the hair salon. This is my self-care. I'm going to do to this. I'm going to go to the spa. Well, I don't have time or money to do that. It's very expensive. So I guess self-care is not for me, if that's, if that's how we think about self-care. Um, Many are busy caring for others. There's a lot of people with people in their homes, especially right now. So it's many of us are parents, many, many out there are people who uh, need to take care for others. And the idea of self-care, it feels like you're, uh, you can't take care of yourself right now because there's other people uh, in need. That many don't know what to do and copy other self-care practices that are not working, which is the worst. Um, when you don't really know what to do, probably you have the time and you're, you figuring out what feels best for you. And you try to do all these practices. It just doesn't feel right. I can tell you, I practice, try to practice yoga for a long time and it just is not for me. I, I, I don't relax in that way. I don't, I don't, I can't practice self-care in that way. It does the opposite for me, um, which is fine. I just tried to find another, another thing to do. But if let's say that people try to do it and they doesn't, it doesn't fit well with them, then it's like, is there something wrong with me? No, it's not. It's not, it's just not the practice for you. You have to connect more with other aspects of your identity to figure out what are the things that are re related to healing in you. Many experience anxiety and feelings of guilt. I should be working, cleaning, spending more time with my kids, the idea of being productive, which is linked to a particular culture value as well, uh, or the, it could stir up unresolved feelings related to self-worth. Uh, I don't deserve this, or I'm not good enough for this. So the idea of widening the, the perspective of healing and self-care provides so much more um, options and, and explanations of why you can probably feel, why so, certain self-care practices can feel boring. And well, it's a way of seeing it. Um, this one idea of self-care, which is the one that we saw in the, in the slide, one that it's kind of the one that I've been hearing and that people share, it's not a bad one, but it's uh, an approach uh, that it's individualistic perspective. Some of them, some of the practices are centering consumption relatable to a privileged social economic status with cultural values of personal space, privacy, and detachment. This doesn't respond necessarily to the needs of other communities outside of this vision. It doesn't provide comfort, release of calm. It sometimes exacerbates feelings of loneliness, of not being worthy, not being able, capable to enjoy it or seeing self-care 
like a luxury. Um, a lot of the times when we were in uh, different meetings or uh, of activities with other people and it was a self-care practice um, that people will do, like, okay, let's practice some self-care. It's like, I need people to recharge or it's, um, I've been trying to look for other things that mean self-care for me and for people in my community um, that resonates more. Um, sometimes I enjoy the, the alone parts and the breathing, of course, and the relaxation. It's just the idea of having a diverse option for self-care. Uh, it's, of course, a, for me, the better, more accurate way of seeing it. Um, of course, we uh, self-care is not new for us as a community. Um, I know that it's kind of like a new term in psychology, like the idea of wellness, um, new in a way that you know, how old psychology is a science is, but, um, meaning like self-care and how to take care of yourself and putting a pause and all that. What this means uh, when we put a, a cultural view on it, we put the uh, lenses of cultural competency, responsiveness, humility, like the cultural lens that um, implies looking at a topic like wellness, uh, we, we found ourselves seeing, well, self-care is not really new for the Hispanic Latino community. Of course it's not. We've been talking in, in mental health, in the mental health field around uh, terms like grounding and breathing and uh, storytelling and circle of peers and uh, talking to our elders for, our entire history. Uh, there's um, a beautiful, um, there's a really great institute in, in Texas. It's the Institute of Chicana Chicano Psychology and Manuel Zaparripa is one of the founders. And he, he talks a lot about uh, this as well. And it's, um, uh, he says that uh, there's three aspects of wellness for the uh, Hispanic, Latinx, uh, Chicanx community, which are identity, family, and spirituality. And um, it's about connecting with our racial and ethnic identities. And what does that mean in terms of healing? So I always, I love the idea of that uh, peer support and, and how how in the field peer support is 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 growing in a wonderful way. I, I love how it's now more um, connected to um, to intervention and 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 providing mental health uh, services. And I always wonder uh, who were the peers and uh, back in the day or and like historically who have been our peers, or, uh, which type of communities have been with us. Um, and how do we integrate in mental health um, those, those approaches of, of, in this case, self-care, but in any mental health um, um, area. Of course, I can't talk about, um, <laughs> I can't talk about peers and community support and community wellness without talking about abuelas or talking about family in our community. There's. Uh, a saying about um, that abuelas are magical, as abuelas son magia, and and the idea of having an older woman sharing you their knowledge and their their values, and it's she represents and it's centered in the family, and and her existence represents a lot of history and connection and love, and even though there's uh, of course families who don't have this figure, or of course families with a different uh, uh, personal history around their, their abuelas or there any uh, female figure in their homes, uh, there is a, a symbolic aspect of, of um, an older woman who carries the history and the cultural values of, of, a, of a community, right? Uh, so it can not necessarily be related to you by blood, but it could be a person that is very ch uh, cher cherished in the communities, a person who carries, um, a lot of information, a lot of wisdom during the years, and of course, a representation of all the values that you cherish, right? Um, uh, or you had the opportunity to have an amazing abuela that is uh, related to you. Um, this has been one of the greatest um, ways of supporting each other um, that are re related to our culture. And there's examples all over the world of uh, how in particular cultures like ours, which are collective cultures who are 
um, intricate and, and, and supported each other with people. Um, uh, elderly women who carry this uh, knowledge and wisdom are um, the best ones or the most uh, comfort people to uh, talk to. There's this project, which is wonderful. It's called the Friendship uh, Bench. Um, it was, uh, it's an evidence-based intervention developed in Zimbabwe, um, where it was a project on um, training elderly women around mental health peer support. And they will sit on a um, bench under a tree in different parks around the town and people will sit with them. Uh, it was a way of um, shortening the gap on mental health and it would provide, people will feel comfortable talking to them. It was more, it felt more natural. It, did, it took the stigma away of going to a psychiatrist, going to a psychologist or counselor. It broke that weird gap of um, institutionalizing um, going for help. And it was amazing. It was a great project. It, was, it went so great that it expanded all over the world. And there's some places, even in the US, that practice, uh, of course, this, um, this project called the Friendship Bench. But it's based on uh, things that are common to us. So it's somebody's talking about this new innovative project that, of course, yes, and we can kind of find it in our, in our history, in our, in our community values, in our cultural values. They're mainly us, and it, it feels familiar to us, so it will work. So the invitation is, of course, to rethink practices of um, self-care that are culturally ours. And, and um, of course, that there are not only like we work for us, they're a part of who we are, but also to, if we're providers and we're part of the, the, we're part of a community who are serving Hispanic and Latinx, um, clients, then just the idea of things like this, just to say self-care, just general practices, um, to widen up that perspective. Uh, how can do that? There's a few suggestions, of course, a few questions just to uh, take you home, take with you. Um, the first one is find a place where you feel a sense of belonging. Um, Particularly for immigrants uh, like me, it's hard because, of course, home is not there anymore. Uh, doesn't there's a specific geographical place that, that it's not the where that I am, um, but a place where you feel a sense of belonging because community care is so so important, um, as well as self care. So the questions around well, where is home? If you can put a geographic. Uh, a space, you can put a space on where is home. It could be your hometown, it could be your specifically parents' home where you grew up with, it could be um, your sorority group, it could be your abuela's uh, house, it could be whatever it is, where is it? If it's geographical, um, with whom does it feel like home? Is it not necessarily where you are, but is with particular with people? This is my group of people that I feel that I'm at home. Um, or it can be when, when does it feel like home? Is it not a space, not with specific people is when I'm doing some things. Is it when I'm making arepas in my kitchen and it could be any kitchen in the world with any people around me. But if I'm doing arepas or doing tacos or doing whatever it is that I'm doing, uh, bollitos, anything, empanadas, that's when it feels like home then it's a practice, it's a thing, and maybe we'll be connected to self-care. So think about that. Uh, but finding a, a sense of belonging, especially for our community, is very, very, very important. Develop pride about your culture. This is, this is I mean, who's not? This is very important. Uh, but be proud of who you are and, and of your community. Become fascinated with your culture. Um, I know that they're growing up probably um, for certain reasons, it depends, everybody's different, but I remember well, uh, listening to people and, and having that internal evaluation myself, but if you're proud of who you are, uh, from your roots, uh, for where you come from, um, do uh, research consistently shows that feeling greater pride in the cultural traditions and accomplishments of one's racial or ethnic group is linked to lower rates of depression and greater well-being. 
our ethnic identity is a self-protective factor. So ask yourself, do you know your family history in particular? Do you know the, his the story of different generations in your family? Uh, how does wellness and self-care look like in your family? And this is a very important question too. The idea of how does self-care look like? Is it my mom or my dad or my, my family in general, my, my parents, my whoever people that you grew up with, how do they do uh, wellness and self-care? Is it a practice that they usually did? Is it not? Is it more like you have to be productive? You have to work, Adi. Uh, there's no time for rest. I'll rest when I die. If that's a thing that it's been passing, uh, how does that connect with you? How does that, knowing about uh, all the social and history and, and cultural components of wellness, how does that affect who I am and how I feel about wellness today? Know your own identity, of course. There's uh, always individual variations in all groups, absolutely. Uh, so besides understanding all these different components for yourself, uh, asking what makes me feel emotionally tired or activates in me a trauma response? What is it about me in particular um, that could cause me these variations? Um, <clears throat> even for, for wellness as well, what are the things that uh, will uh, connect specifically to me and my, uh, my history? And what aspects of being Hispanic Latinx uh, am I most proud of, particularly myself? What are the things that I can connect with um, that is probably not the same from my parents or uh, my, my, my um, siblings or other generations or even people from the same community and friends uh, or peers. But what is it about being who I am and my in this body that I live in and with this uh, values that I carry and that I share with the community that I'm most proud of? Explore your spirituality, um, meaning, spirituality meaning, uh, not necessarily, of course, religion, but uh, if you have um, part of our values connected to this, uh, but your, your um, spirituality, your connection, it can be connection with nature and the land, it can be ancestral wisdom, it can be uh, people who say, like, I want I want to enrich my soul by connecting with other souls. It doesn't have to be necessarily like an institutionalized uh, religion or practice, but explore it because it's part of, of our community history. Even though you don't share it, at least understanding and exploring that uh, would be interesting to develop a, a more holistic and, and um, self of, of well-being. So how do you feel connected with yourself and with others? And what cultural gift and values have helped you during rough times, even if it's not necessarily a higher being, if it's not necessarily connecting to others, um, what are the cultural gift and values um, that you practice in the past have helped you during rough times? And of course, cultivate joy, make space and space to enjoy life and celebrate your culture, your traditions, your history and community. Um, there's time for joy should be protected, should be reclaimed, honored, and protected. Um, so the questions are, what cultural values contribute to my happiness? Uh, what aspects of being Hispanic like me and most proud of when I feel joy? And with that, I know we have uh, a little bit of a few minutes uh, to if there's any questions or comments, but um, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Ari, for that incredible presentation. I am so like excited to have been here to listen. Um, I know you were speaking from your experiences as um, coming from like Venezuela and like my family is from Mexico. And so seeing those like differences, but also mostly the similarities, it's just been fantastic. Um, I'll give a couple seconds to see if anybody has questions. I can put it in the Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen. I did want to answer one vocally um, that was in the chat, which is that um, this video will be captioned in post-production. It will be placed on YouTube where those captions will be auto-generated and then corrected later. Um, Ari, we had some really wonderful comments in the chat, so I hope you have a couple seconds to like just scroll through. We've had some conversations about you know getting sick and just being you know, surrounded by community, even like months after like the sickness had passed and like being asked about it. That was an incredible story to have been shared. So if you can, if you have time, you want to scroll up and, and check that out. But 
yeah, we'll see if there's any um, any questions. And um, thank you again, Ari. It's been incredible. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is always I I miss doing this type of conversations and just presentations uh, with people because you get to listen to people's stories and how any of this resonates or sometimes it doesn't and then it's it's their own experience that that mm -hmm. uh, comes to the table but um well looks like um i'm also so here's my my email as well so if there's any comments or questions afterwards please reach out i'm always happy to connect as well Okay, I see one question. It says, uh, how would you define decolonized mindfulness? It is the same as, as decolonized self-care. This is a great question, especially because there's, um, so in psychology, when we have different um, interventions, um, the idea of decolonization, uh, it, can, it can come from different aspects. So it can be from identifying where does the practice from in the first place and how it's being used and how it can be applied to um, different communities, right? Um, I'm, not, um, I'm not a mindfulness expert, but I will, I will invite you to, um, when, we, when we talk about mindfulness, do we, do we kind of know exactly where does the practice come from? Is it a practice that uh, initiated as a, as a you know, um, um, in the US is a specific like psychology intervention practice or, or it came from other uh, communities in different parts of the world. Are we using it in the same way? Are we taking practices who are, uh, which are based on connection and support and for people or we're taking practices that are individual practice of relaxation and like uh, going back to our bodies in the same way. It's more like, um, I will, I will ask myself those questions first, um, but I can always send you resources about decolonized mindfulness. Uh, if that will be an interest, we, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah.